Well, good evening, folks. It's great to see you this evening. It's good to be gathered together on this Lord's Day evening as we come to worship the Lord. Just a reminder about the announcements from this morning, just uh, to highlight the prayer meetings that are happening this week for the mission that starts next uh, Saturday night, really. Uh, remember the prayer meeting tomorrow evening at 8 p.m., uh, and then Wednesday evening will be our prayer meeting and Bible study as normal. But uh, if you can, I would encourage you to come along as we pray for the mission that is just around the corner now. Well, I said this morning that we were going to do something uh, a little bit different uh, this evening. That tonight we want to think about the whole idea of uh, definitive sanctification. Now, that's why I didn't announce that this morning for fear that there wouldn't be anyone here uh, this evening. Now, we are going to explore that and what it means and the whole uh, thrust behind it. So as our call to worship, we hear the words of the psalmist in, in Psalm 51 and verse 10. David, we remember, has been caught in his sin with Bathsheba and what is it that he asks for create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me David recognizes here that this creation of a clean heart this renewal of his spirit is something that can only come from God it's not something that he can work in and through himself it's not something that he can give himself but it comes to him solely from God and we're going to use these words of Psalm 51 as we stand together and begin our time of praise this evening. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Wash me, cleanse me, purify me. Make my heart as white as snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. We'll stand together as we sing God's praise. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come this evening, we pray that the, the prayer of the psalmist might be our own prayer tonight. That as we gather before you as the holy, righteous, just, perfect God, as we gather before you this evening as the God who is utterly different from us, utterly set apart from us, we recognize tonight, Heavenly Father, our own sin. We recognize tonight our own feelings and faults. We recognize tonight, Heavenly Father, those ways that we choose to live our own way, those times when we choose to live our own way, those times, perhaps, Heavenly Father, when we recognize what the right thing to do is, and yet we fail to do it. 
when we recognize the way that you would have us go. And yet, Heavenly Father, as Isaiah reminds us, like sheep, we turn to our own way. And so we pray right at the outset of our time of worship this evening that you would create a clean heart in us. We pray that you would cleanse us and purify us. We pray, Father, that you would renew our spirits within us. We thank you, Father, for those words of absolution that we so often remind ourselves that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And yet, Heavenly Father, if we are, if we confess our sin, that you are a just God who will forgive us. And so we come tonight claiming that promise that despite the week that's gone, despite the sin that there's been, despite the, the hardness of heart that there's been, that if we come tonight and confess our sin, if we come tonight and acknowledge our sin, that you are the God who will forgive. We thank you tonight, Father, that you are the God of grace, the God with whom there is always a second chance. The God tonight who sanctifies us and cleanses us. The God who, as the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins and transgressions from us. As we come tonight, Father, we thank you for the be benefit and blessing of the church family. We thank you for the church family here in Glenworry. We thank you, Father, for the way that you have joined us together, for the way that you call us together, for the way that you increase our love for one another for the way that you build us up to be the people that you would have us be. We thank you, Father, for the blessing that it is to belong here. We thank you for the encouragement that it is to be numbered amongst your people. And as we come tonight, Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to gather together on this Lord's Day evening. We recognize tonight, Father, that there are many of our brothers and sisters in far off lands who don't enjoy this same privilege, who can't meet together for fear of the authorities. We recognize tonight, Heavenly Father, that there are many within our own lands who can't meet together due to lack of numbers, due to, to, to lack of interest amongst folk. That the evening service is a dwindling proposition in many churches but we thank you father that we are here tonight we thank you for the blessing that it is to begin our week by worshiping you morning and evening and we pray father that as we come now father that you would be with us we pray father that this next hour might be a, a blessed hour to our souls it might strengthen us in our faith and we pray father as we consider this topic of definitive sanctification tonight father we pray that it might despite the, the, the heavy sound and nature of it, that it might be a great comfort to our hearts to know that we are those who have been sanctified tonight, that we are those who have been set apart as holy tonight in and through your son, Jesus Christ. Continue with us now, we ask. Bless us in what remains of our time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, friends, we're going to read the scene in from Psalm 103. Uh, again, the sermon is going to be in no way an exposition of what we read here in Psalm 103. We're going to jump around uh, a few different passages as we think about the topic, but what we do have in Psalm 103 is a, a great explanation for us of this whole idea of definitive sanctification. Psalm 103, the psalmist says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. 
The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels. You mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Well, friends, we're going to join our hearts together in the praise of God again, just as we come to think about this. And we're going to do it from Psalm 103. Praise God, my soul, with all my heart. Let me exalt his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. His praise, my soul, in song proclaim. We'll stand together as we sing God's praise.
Well, friends, I would encourage you tonight to really have a Bible uh, open in front of you. We're going to jump around a few different passages, so it'll be helpful that if you can uh, have it in front of you and see what it is that we're saying together. Now, why did I consider this topic this evening? Why did we come to this topic this evening? Now, I could give you a, a, a theological answer and say that the Lord really laid it on my heart to share this uh, tonight, and none of you could really argue with that on the way out. The truth is probably much more pragmatic than that, that I, I, I've... Uh, had three talks to prepare this week as well as various other different bits and pieces. Uh, and quite simply, this is one of the talks that I was preparing already. I think also we're coming into this time of mission next Sunday, Sunday after. Uh, we won't be in Ezra anyway. So I thought it was a bit foolish to do, do one sermon in Ezra and then have a two-week break and pick up another sermon uh, in Ezra again when we're going to have to restart all over again anyway. Uh, and most of all, I feel that this topic is hugely beneficial to us. It's part of a two-part series, really. We'll have uh, definitive sanctification tonight as we think about it, and then Wednesday evening at our prayer meeting and Bible study, we're going to think about progressive sanctification, and hopefully uh, those terms will mean something to you, uh, and if not after this evening, hopefully they will mean something to you. We're going to start tonight by thinking about this whole idea of definitive sanctification and if we're going to understand that, it's really important for us to understand what sanctification is. What do we mean when we talk about sanctification, whether it's definitive, whether it's progressive? What is sanctification? What do we mean when we use that term, sanctification? Sanctification is really the process by which we become more holy, we become more set apart. It's that process whereby we learn to say no to sin and yes to God. We're that process where we become more and more like Jesus Christ. The Spirit enables us in our lives to put sin to death and to live lives of increasing righteousness. That's a big picture, a big broad definition of what sanctification is. That process by which we become more and more holy. So as we come to definitive sanctification tonight then, I think it's important for us to understand what it is that we mean. I'm, I'm, I think the, the, the term can get lost very easily, but we use it all the time. You know, let's say you're sick. And you say to your husband, wife, son, daughter, whoever it is, you say, you know, bring me a pill. Now what does that mean? That could be any number of things. You know, it might be a paracetamol, it might be an aspirin, it might be uh, an antibiotic could be anything but if you say bring me the pill that's the definite article you're talking about a particular pill a particular remedy you're talking about the medicine perhaps that the doctor has prescribed it's the definite article that makes all the difference it's a definite article that takes it from being something big that could be anything to being something specific so as we talk about definitive sanctification then it's that once-for-all act of sanctification. It's that definite act. It's that time when we are taken from being sinners to being righteous, when we're taken from being those who God sees as sinners to being those that God sees as righteous. It's a definite moment. It's a definite time. It's that moment whenever we are united to Christ by faith. That moment when our sin is dealt with and God sees us now no longer as sinners but as those who are righteous in Christ. At that moment in God's sight we are sanctified definitively. Not that we are not sinners, not that we will never sin again but rather that our sin has been atoned for, that our sin has been paid for and Christ has dealt with it once and for all, we are sanctified in Christ. Definitive sanctification then this evening is a monergistic work of God in the life of a believer. Whereby he takes our sin and having laid it all on Christ does not count it as ours anymore. It's the work of God. It's not our work. It's a monergistic, mono meaning one, ergo meaning work, one work of God to be definitively sanctified once and for all. 
Now let's get into a few passages, hopefully that will flesh this out a little bit for us and help us to see what it is that we're talking about tonight. The first one's the one that we opened our service with from Psalm 51. Again, I encourage you to have that open in front of you. Psalm 51 has that very well-known background. David has sinned with Bathsheba. David has had Bathsheba's husband Uriah sent to the front line so that he would die. And all of this has been told to him by Nathan the prophet. And at the exposure of his sin, at the exposure of how he has lived unrighteously, David then pens Psalm 51. He asks verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. David realizes here that there's little that he can do to atone for his sin. There's little that he can do to make his sin right. He knows that he can't sanctify himself. He knows that he can't make himself holy. And so he asks the Lord, verse 1, have mercy on me. He asks, verse 7, Lord, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You see, David realizes here that there isn't a sacrifice that can be offered to make himself right with God once and for all. There isn't a price that can be paid by him to atone for his sin. There might be sacrifices that can be offered, but he recognizes the, the inferiority of those sacrifices. He recognizes that if he's to be truly washed, if he's to be truly cleansed, if he's to be truly purified, it must come to him from God. It must be that God purges him. It must be that God cleanses him. It must be that God makes him whiter than the snow. He can't do anything in and of himself to make himself clean. And we perhaps see this most clearly with those verses that we opened the service with. Verse 10, Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. There was nothing David could do to purify himself. There was nothing that David could do to sanctify himself. It must be God who creates this clean heart within him. It must be God who purifies him. It must be God who renews his spirit. It was entirely God's work and only God's work to create a clean heart in him. It would be entirely the judgment of God that declared him pure or not. It would be entirely the judgment of God that made him right or not. David sees Psalm 51 that if the Lord declares him not guilty, that if the Lord sanctifies him, that if the Lord purifies him, then he will be purer than the snow. Let's flick on to Psalm 103, those verses that we read. Psalm 103 is a lovely psalm. It's a psalm that has been put to, to many modern hymns and uh, tunes. It captures many of the themes of the psalm. Psalm 103, there's no specific reference in the life of David. It's not like Psalm 51 where we can say, well, this is after David has sinned. Rather, the introduction to us just simply says Psalm 103, a psalm of David. And look at verse 10. What does the psalmist, what does David remind us of? Verse 10, he does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquity. He doesn't give us what we deserve because of our sin. He doesn't repay us for our sin as we should be repaid. He doesn't give us what we deserve, but rather, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We see there that moment of definitive sanctification, that moment, verse 12, where our sin is removed as far as the east is from the west from us, that our sin is taken so far away from us that we do not carry it any longer. And it's all simply the work of God. As far apart as you can imagine is how far the Lord has removed our sin from us. It's not an ongoing process in David's life here. It's not something that is a, a, a continual process. But it's something that God has done 
for the psalmist. He has taken his sin away from him. He doesn't see the psalmist any longer as one who is defiled by sin. But he sees him as one who is righteous. It isn't that the psalmist here has offered the right sacrifice. It isn't here that the psalmist has atoned for his own sin. It isn't that he has paid the price. It's simply the sovereign work of God to remove his sin from him. To cast it into that sea without bottom or shore. It's the single work of God to sanctify the believer from sin. We are definitively made righteous tonight in Christ. We are definitively sanctified tonight in Christ. We are made holy in God's sight tonight in Christ as the sole work of God. We see that then in the Psalms. Perhaps Psalm 51 created me a clean heart. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west. But let's flick on into uh, the New Testament now. And Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. We might be tempted tonight to think that this idea of definitive sanctification is just uh, a concept that we find in the Psalms. It's just an idea that we find in the Psalms, but actually we find it throughout the New Testament as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Paul, we remember, is writing this letter to a church in Corinth, to a group of believers who are gathered together in Corinth. It's a church that has many problems. It's a church that we remember uh, a, a believer has taken his stepmother to be his wife, and the people in Corinth were rejoicing in it. It's a church where there's lots of problems going on that Paul's writing this letter to address. But right at the start, what does he say? 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of Christ. How are they described? They're described as those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. They are sanctified. They are set apart. They are made holy in Christ. Despite everything that's going on, despite all of the problems in the church in Corinth, despite the way that the believers still sin, despite the way that the believers are still falling short in that church, Paul describes them right at the start as those who are sanctified. It's a definitive act in the past. It's something that God has done for them. God has sanctified them in Christ, made them holy in Christ. It's something that's happened in the past. It's something that has continuing consequences. Of course it does. But they, in the present moment that Paul writes, can be described as those who are sanctified. Those who have been made holy. I was trying to think of the best way to, to, to illustrate this, and as inadequate as it is, this was the best that I could come up with. Last week, uh, last Wednesday, I think, maybe Thursday, anyway, Suzanne and I celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary. Now, that was a thing that happened in the past. That was a day in the past, but it has continuing consequences. You see, I say that I'm married today because of that day in the past. Not that we get married every day anew, but that day in the past has continuing consequences in our lives. And we can't really decide one day, well, look, I don't really want to be married today. That's not how it works generally. That day in the past has continuing consequences in your life. And so too with our sanctification, that event in the past, that death of Christ in the past, means that we are sanctified today. Means that we are righteous and holy today. 
There won't come a day when God will say, well, look, they aren't sanctified anymore. There won't come a day whenever God says, well, look, actually, we need to do something else. We're going to move the goalposts. We're going to shift the agenda. No, we are those who have been sanctified in Christ. We have been sanctified by the work of God, uniting us by faith to Christ Jesus so that our sin is no longer held against us. Definitive sanctification is the monergistic work of God alone, sanctifying us in Christ Jesus, making people holy, viewing people as holy, Second in 1 Corinthians, flick on then, 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. At the beginning of this section, then Paul's warning the believers about the dangers of lawsuits amongst themselves, of everyone asserting their rights, of wanting to have their rights met. And Paul says, well, look, why not rather suffer the loss of all things? Why not be willing to give them up to your brothers and sisters? And he says to them, verse 9, look, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then we come probably, I think, to one of my favorite Bible verses, verse 11. And such were some of you. This is how you used to live, Paul says. This is what people used to say about you behind your back. This was how people thought about you. You were those who were sexually immoral. You were those who were idolaters, adulterers. You were those who practiced homosexuality. You were a thief, a greedy, a drunkard, a reviler, a swindler. That's how you used to live, Paul says. It wasn't like these were good moral people in Corinth. It wasn't like these were people who had improved themselves. They were kind of the worst of the worst, Paul says, and such were some of you. But that's not their case anymore, is it? Because he continues, such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were made holy In God's sight, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Again, notice here that this isn't progressive sanctification. This isn't the Corinthians improving little bit by little bit by little bit. This isn't the Corinthians putting to death sin in their lives little bit by little bit by little bit. Rather, this is Paul saying, this is what God has done for you. You were sanctified. That day, that moment when you came to Christ in faith, you were made holy. You were made righteous in God's sight. They are counted as those who have never sinned because of the monergistic work of God. You used to be sinners, but now you're righteous. You used to be those who fell short of God's standards, but now you've met them. Now you are sanctified in Christ. Two final references to finish with. The first one's in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, towards the back of uh, the New Testament. You get to all the T's, they're usually all together. First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy. Uh, and Titus are all together towards the back of the New Testament. And 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 21. We'll read from verse 20. But again, set the context. Timothy, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, or his letters written to his young friends, his young ministry colleague. And it's really an encouragement for Timothy to keep going. It's an encouragement for Timothy to press on to the work that he's been called. And he encourages Timothy to be a workman who is approved by God, a workman who needs not be ashamed of his work. And he says to him, 2 Timothy 2.20, Now, 
In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. In every house, Paul says, there's plates that are used for Christmas dinner. There's plates that are used for every day. There's plates that are used, you know, maybe when the minister comes around for tea. There's plates that are valuable and there's plates that are used every day. So do your best, Paul says, to be an honorable vessel. Do your best to be one of the good china plates. Do your best to be cleansed, set apart as holy. And again, it's that same idea, something that has been sanctified, something that has been set apart, something that is for honorable use, something that is sanctified in the past. And that sanctification here, that setting apart as holy, is the once for all act of God that sets a person apart as common, from common to holy that takes their use from common every day to wholly set apart for God. So that's the big picture. That's the biblical theology, if you like, of definitive sanctification. That it's the monergistic work of God, that it's God's act alone that takes us in that moment of uniting to Christ by faith, takes us from being unrighteous to righteous, that takes us from being unholy to to holy but on what basis does God no longer count our sin against us on what basis are we sanctified definitively once and for all tonight and for that then we turn to our final bible reference which is John chapter 19 and verse 30 John chapter 19 and verse 30 John 19 is John's account of the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus receives the sour wine, verse 30. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now we could look at that tonight and say that what Jesus means here is that his earthly life is finished. His pilgrimage on this life is complete. Now that may be true, but there is a deeper significance to it, I think. It is not simply that his life is over. It's not simply that he is about to die. But rather what he's saying here is that the sacrifice for sin has been offered. That there's no sacrifice for sin left to be paid because Christ has paid it all. That as Jesus died, the sacrifice was offered once for all. The price for sin was definitively paid. And so Jesus could say, it is finished. And therefore, on that basis alone, God can look at us tonight and declare us holy. God can look at us tonight and say that we have never sinned. We are definitively sanctified tonight. We are as holy in God's sight as we will ever be tonight. Because when God looks at us, he sees Christ's sacrifice, not our sin. When God looks at us, he sees that the price has been paid. He sees us as we are sanctified in Christ. I don't know about you. But if your life is anything like mine tonight, I know that I'm not definitively sanctified in this life. I know there are times when I'm unjustly angry. I know there are times whenever I lust after things. There are times when I tell half-truths in order to save myself. Yet when God looks at us tonight, he sees us as definitively sanctified once and for all, made holy in his sight, not because of our obedience, not because of all that we have done, not because of our good works, but because of the works of Christ, because John 19.30, it is 
finished. That work that means tonight, whatever sin the devil may choose to cast up against you, however he may seek to tell you that you could never be holy because of what you do, that we can look tonight to heaven and we can see our high priest We can see our elder brother set at the right hand of God on high and know that he pleads our case from there. Know that those hands which bear the mark of nails sit on God's right hand and declare the price has been paid. Declare tonight that we are sanctified, we are holy because of him. Friends, how we must embrace that tonight. Embrace our status as redeemed children of God. Sanctified children of God. And how we must rejoice tonight in that definitive once for all sanctification that is simply the monergistic work of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this evening for that work of grace that you've done in our hearts and our lives. We thank you for that moment when we are taken from death to life forever, that moment when we're taken from being sinners in the hands of a righteous God to being brought near as brothers and sisters, as children of the Most High God. We thank you, Father, that we are sanctified this evening not because of ourselves, not because of any good that we've done, but all because of Christ. Help us to embrace that status. Help it to be a spur for holy living, we ask. Bless us now in what remains of our time together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to say that there is a A counterpoint to that in our thinking about progressive sanctification that we're going to think about on Wednesday evening. So again, I would encourage you to come along to that, to to, to hear the the counterbalance to it. Um, One of the great claims that if we believe in definitive sanctification, which we do, I hope, is that then it offers no spur for holy living. If we're as righteous in God's sight, if we're as sanctified in God's sight as we ever will be, then it offers no spur for holy living. But come along on Wednesday evening and we'll see, hopefully the spur that there is for holy living. But in response to what we've heard this evening, we're going to sing these wonderful, beautiful words. His mercy is more what love could remember. No wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. But his mercy is more. Let's stand together as we sing God's praise.
Well, friends, let's join our hearts together in prayer for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider those words that we've just been singing, we are so grateful for your mercy this evening. And as we come tonight, Father, we recognize that as we preach the gospel, as we share the good news of Jesus Christ, we are but beggars telling other beggars where we can find bread. And as we come tonight, Father, we really want to pray for the mission that's coming up next Sunday evening, next Saturday night, as we have the family fun night. We pray for next Saturday evening, Father, just that it would be a good time of fun and friendship and fellowship. We pray that as we gather together as a, a, a church family, we pray, Father, that others would come and would seek to join in with us. We pray, Father, for those invitations that have gone out, for those invitations that have landed in homes. We pray, Father, just that you would be at work even now. Call to mind that invitation, that you would be not giving people peace until they come along. We pray, Father, that maybe as folks do come along, that they would find a, a warm welcome here, that they would find a place that they feel that they belong, a place where they feel that they are accepted. We pray, Father, for safety. Next Saturday night, especially, we know there's lots of moving parts between bouncy castles and footballs and just so many different things that could potentially go wrong. And yet, Father, we trust you as the sovereign God of the universe who will do all things well. We pray for favorable weather as we have so many activities planned for outside. Just, Father, we pray that you would oversee in all of it, partake in all of it, we ask. We pray that these would not be our plans that we are sticking rigidly to, but that these would be your plans. As we think of the mission that is coming up, Father, we want to pray especially for Andrew this evening, that as he finalizes the talks and as you give him those words to speak, Father, we pray just that you would help him with the busyness of his life, we pray, Father, that as he comes, that he would be able to make connection with folks, that he'd be able to speak in a way that is easily understandable. And we pray, Father, that even now you'd be preparing the hearts and minds of people to come along. We think tonight, Father, of those who perhaps have never made a profession of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would be at work in their lives the Spirit will be ministering to them, that he might be bringing them to that point of repentance and faith. We thank tonight, Father, of those who perhaps have made a profession of faith at one time, but have since fallen away. Perhaps those like Dimas who are in love with the present world. We pray, Father, that you would help Andrew to speak to them, that he would have a word in season for them that they too might be called to repentance, that they too might be called to live lives worthy of the calling that they have received. We pray tonight, Father, just that the Spirit would be at work. That as Graham so helpfully reminded us last Sunday morning that it wouldn't be a valley of dry bones that we're living in that it would be a valley where the Spirit of God is at work, where people are being brought from death to life. We continue to remember tonight, Father, all those within the fellowship who are going through times of difficulty, testing, who are experiencing times of need. May you be near to them. May you be very real to them. May your presence comfort them and uplift them, even in dark and difficult moments. We thank, Father, of those who are going through treatment for cancer. We thank, Father, of those who have lost loved ones in recent weeks. May they know your sustaining arms of grace all around them. And we pray, Father, now that you would continue with us. Bless us in what remains of our time together. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to bring our time of worship to a close this evening again as we respond to what we've heard from God's word and song. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow 
in ceaseless praise. We'll stand together as we sing God's praise. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>